So the first question this morning is this, why are there so many translations of the Bible? When does something stop being a translation and starts becoming a mistranslation according to Revelation 22, 18 through 19? So I thought this is a pretty good question. Why are there so many translations of the Bible, right? I mean, we say that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, incorruptible word of God. And if we believe that, and if that's true, then why are there literally hundreds of versions of the Bible? So that was a question that actually appeared multiple times this week. And so we're going to dive into it. But in order to really get everybody on the right foundation, I want to read to you Revelation 22, 18, which was cited in the original question. It says this, For if I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to them the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book and of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So really, really coming in strong here, out of the gate, Revelation 22 literally says God takes his word so seriously that if you were to detract, if you were to leave any part out when you're copying it, translating it, communicating it, that he will leave out your inheritance to heaven. An everlasting life. You'll be left out of the Lamb's book of life if you leave out pieces of the scripture. Revelation 22 goes on to say, and if you add things to my holy book, then the plagues that are described in the text will be added to your life. I mean, you know, God is not playing games. He is serious about the sanctity of his word. I want to remind you of another example of how seriously God takes his word, the Bible, all the way back in 2 Samuel chapter 6, they were, David, King David, was transporting the Ark of the Covenant, which was this golden box which had two cherubim on either side, and inside of it were uh, the Ten Commandments, and basically the Ark of the Covenant represented the physical presence of God on earth. And so David wanted to bring it to the capital city of Jerusalem. So he gets this entire parade, all these musicians, and he lines up this great processional to bring the ark into Jerusalem. And David gets a little bit lazy, and he decides instead of transporting the ark the way Scripture tells him to, he's just going to put it on a cart, and an ox will pull it. It was faster, it was more convenient, and way easier. So David put the ark on a cart, And as they begin to march towards Jerusalem, the Bible says that the oxen began to stumble. And a man named Uzzah reached out his hand to stable the ark. And as he touched it, he fell as a dead man. It killed the parade. That thing was over instantly. And this is a depiction of what it looks like when we mishandle God's word. It's a picture of what it looks like when we mishandle God's presence. Remember, inside the Ark of the Covenant was the written tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments themselves. It is a very serious thing for us to approach the Word of God. He takes it very seriously. Did you know that the Bible even tells you that not many of you should desire to be preachers and teachers of the Word because you'll be held to a higher standard and be held more accountable? Everybody's like, oh, I want to preach, I want to preach. Well, do you really? Because you're going to be held to a higher standard. Because God is, he is passionate about his word. So back to the question, if God's word is true and it's holy and sovereign, then why are there so many translations? I'm sure you've probably heard skeptics of your faith. And when they ask this question, there's an undercurrent of doubt. When they ask this question, what they're really implying is, if, if it's really infallible, then Why didn't he just do one translation? Why not just one version? And so we're going to unpack that answer this morning. And I'm really excited about it. It's powerful. So the first reason why there are many translations of the Bible is there are different translation philosophies that have resulted in different translations of the Bible. 
Now, I would encourage you to take notes. Nine o'clock was not taking notes either. They were just sitting there looking at me. I promise you, this is good information that really, really will help you and come in handy. So even if you have your smartphone or you don't have anything, just pretend like you're taking notes. It just, you just feel smarter. You look smarter that way, okay? But we had, number one, why do we have so many translations? We have so many translations because there are so many philosophies on how you translate the Bible. Okay, I'm going to help you see it, all right? Newsflash. The Bible was not written in English. It was written in three languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. No, the King James Version is not the original version of the Bible. Stop with that, all right? It came in 1611 at the commissioning of King James, all right? And it wasn't even the first English translation, so you're welcome for that, okay? The Bible wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And so the Bible, in order for us to profit from it, in order for us to learn and profit, I don't mean making money, although people did, but I'm talking about for us to learn and gain value, it had to be translated into English. Can I get a, a person who's thankful that it was translated into English? And you see, the translation of Scripture has been a big deal over the years because for centuries, the early church held on to the text and they didn't want it replicated at a mass volume because they wanted power and control over the people. They were afraid that if you actually read the scripture, it would debunk their religious creation in their kingdoms that they had erected. Whole another sermon. But the Bible had to be translated into English and there were four major philosophies on how scholars translated the scripture. The first philosophy that I want to show you is this, a word-for-word -word translation. Look at your neighbor and tell them word-for-word. Word. Now, let me give you just a little bit more context before we dive deeper into this first philosophy. The Bible was written in manuscripts. And just for those of you who don't know what a manuscript is, it's literally in the name, manuscript. Manu meaning manual. Somebody wrote it and inscribed it. This was before the printing press, before all the digital age and all this stuff. They literally, a scribe would have to meticulously copy the scripture by hand. That's what's called a manuscript. And I want you to know that you can sit in here with perfect and brilliant confidence because there are more manuscripts for the Bible than any other book in history many, many times over. Did you know that there are, 20, there are over 24,000 Greek manuscripts, intact manuscripts of the New Testament Bible? Over 24,000. Now, you don't, but judging by your reaction, you're not too excited about that, but let me help you understand why that should get you excited. The second closest book in history is Homer's Iliad, and it has less than 1,300 manuscripts, yet no one questions its validity. I'm just going to drop the mic right here. We just had church. Here's why that matters to you in just plain English. Because if you've ever seen a picture of a manuscript, sometimes there are like words missing and letters missing, and it's like, well, I think they meant this, or I think they meant that. But homie, when you have 25,000, if one manuscript is missing a sentence, you got 23,000 other ones that got it. So they cross-reference as scholars to bring with confidence and certainty a brilliant depiction, preserving beautifully the holy, sacred word of the living God. That's amazing, church. It really is amazing. But okay, why do we have so many translations? We have so many translations because there's so many philosophies on how you translate the Bible. The first is word for word. Now, let's make the first observation. There is not an English word for every Greek word. And there's not an English word for every Aramaic or Hebrew word. Newsflash. Hate to break it to you. It's just that's not how language works. Okay? I don't know much about language. I took Spanish 2 in high school and I failed it horribly. Okay? So, like, my parents are not proud of that. Um, but language is tough, and I can tell you from experience, they don't always line up. So when you don't have an exact English word for a Greek word, 
or an exact English word for Hebrew or Aramaic, these scholars have to come together and use their knowledge and their expertise in the ancient languages to present the closest English word to what it is, okay? But you can trust that there have been many brilliant scholars who are experts who have done this. But a word-for-word -word translation is where these scholars literally took each word in the manuscript and they assigned it the closest English word possible, okay? This is beautiful. Examples of a word-for-word -word translation are the ESV, the King James Version, and the NASB. Anybody got one of those translations? You should be happy. Give, give a little shout out like I got a word for word, right? So that's why like people are so passionate about the King James Version because it is a word for word translation. Scholars literally meticulously combed over every single word and they assigned it the closest English word that they could. All right. So word for word is one type of translation. And this is a great way to translate the Bible. I will tell you, Sometimes word-for-word -word translations are a little choppy, they're a little rigid, and they're a little bit hard to read, which is why the second philosophy of translating the Bible was created, and that is thought for thought. So the first philosophy is word-for-word, -word. the second is thought for thought. This is where scholars would come together, and instead of translating every single word, they would take a sentence, they would take a phrase, and they would take the thought, the principle that's being taught here, and they would translate that into the English language the best way possible. Some examples of a thought-for-thought -thought translation would be the New Living Translation or the NIV. I often read from the New Living Translation, and I also read from the King James Version because my Bible has a parallel. I got one on one side and one on the other. One is word for word and the other is thought for thought. But the beauty here is that even in thought for thought translations, the scholars were taking immense detail to preserve the principles and doctrine of the Christian faith and translating it into English, okay? Is this helping anybody? Yeah. Am I boring you? I thought I bored nine o'clock too, but they were just listening. <laughs> the third philosophy of translating the Bible is the balanced approach, the balanced approach. And that is exactly what its name implies. It's a balance of both, word for word and thought for thought. So there are translations that literally, you'll be reading Genesis 1 and it's a word for word translation. And then chapter three is a thought for thought. So it's balanced. It's got both of them in there. An example of a balanced translation would be the HCSB. And, and by the way, are you beginning to see now how there are many translations and why they are? It's because there are different philosophies on how they translated the manuscripts into English. Okay? So this does not invalidate your scripture. It just shows you that there were many reasons, many philosophies, some word for word, some thought for thought, and some balance. That's why we have a wide array of translations. But there is a fourth way to translate the Bible. And this one happens to be my least favorite. And we've been digressing as we go down. The fourth is paraphrase translation. This would be the Message Bible and the Passion Version and others that want to paraphrase the Bible. Guys, listen to me. When you go to a bookstore or you go online, who goes to a bookstore anymore? Anyway, when you go online... Sorry, somebody just hated me right there. Um, you, just, you can't just be like, oh, Bible, there we go. I got one. This is awesome. There are these translations. You need to do your homework. You need to study a little bit into how was this Bible translated? Was it, is it a word for word? Is it a thought for thought? Is it both? Or is this thing a paraphrase? Because a paraphrase can go way out there into left field. And paraphrases, unfortunately, have been really loosely translated, okay? So they're a little bit wild. Now hear me. I'm not here this morning to hate on the message version or whatever paraphrase version you use, but I do wanna implore you with this. If you are gonna use a paraphrase version of the Bible, please, please, please 
Use a, a King James or a word for word. Use another translation in comparison to it, okay? Because otherwise you'd be drifting way out here. Everybody agree with what I'm saying today? So as you can see, I've given you four different variations of how scripture was translated. And within each of those four categories, you have, me, you have numerous amounts of translations that fit within them. So this is not like your science book where they're going, oops, edition 1.0, we got to come out with 2.0 because we got that thing wrong. So we got to update it and fix it and change it. This is the reason that there are so many scriptures and so many versions of the Bible. And there, are, there are many ways to translate it and bring it into English. Really quickly, there are two versions that I want to warn you about while I got you. The first is the NWT. No, that is not a wrestling federation. All right, some of y'all were like, yeah, I know that. I watched that on Saturday night. No, no, no. No, NWT is the New World Translation. Okay, and it tries to slither its way in as though it's just another version of the Bible. No, it is not. It is heresy. In fact, the NWT, the New World Translation, is a publication of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It is heresy. It detracts from the deity of Jesus Christ. And it's easily confused or misunderstood as just another translation. I'll tell you a little story. One day... Not too long ago, I was scrolling on Instagram, trying to find the bottom. And I came to a church. Some of you just now got that. <laughs> it's all right, nine, nine o'clock was sleeping too. So I was on Instagram scrolling, and I found like a famous church. And they posted a picture of this person holding up the Bible. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of a cool picture. And then I like read, and it said, New World Translation. And I was like, I was like, now, nah, hey, I know this pastor. I know these people. They don't preach that. So I, that, that was the fastest DM I ever shot in my life, other than when I met, hit on Christina. Besides, and uh, <laughs> you, you know that's funny and you're welcome. And she ignored me for a year. She likes to brag about it, how hard she was to get. But it, I wore her down. Men, when you marry up, you have to wear them down. That's free. Whole nother sermon. Anyway, <laughs> woo, we're way off here. You're like, what question are we on anyway? Okay. But anyway, so I messaged this church, and I'm like, hey, do you know that what you got on your gram is the Jehovah's Witness Bible? And they were like, oh, and they like quickly took it down and stuff. But you know what? They didn't even follow me back. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that was at least worth one follow back. I mean, come on now. I'm saving you from heresy out here. Just kidding. I don't even care. Well, a little bit. Anyway, um... But, like, I'm just trying to show you how easy it is to get confused and end up in the wrong translation. So I want to challenge you as believers. I want to challenge you. Please be intentional with the Bible that you read. Do your homework. Find out. Was it a word-for-word -word translation? Was it a thought-for-thought -thought translation? Find out what you're reading because you, it's okay to study different versions. But you need to come back to the, the closest and most reliable translations that we can, okay? I'm gonna give you just one more example. Actually, before I do that, I'm gonna give you the second point real quick on why there's so many translations. The second reason there's so many translations is because there's a lot of languages. Newsflash, I failed one, Spanish. There's a lot of languages out there. So that's why there's a lot of translations because the gospel is for every tribe, every nation, and every tongue, all right? Third reason that it's important, and there's many translations, is because language changes over time. Y'all, this is important. I pray I'm not boring you. This is important. The English language has changed drastically since 1611 when the King James Bible was written. In fact, like if something is really cool now, we're like, that's sick or that's bad. Do people say sick anymore? <laughs> nah, kind of, I'm old. So anyway, people are like, that, that's sick, dude, or that's like so bad, or like fire and like destructive things, but like, that actually means good. That actually means good, right? So like the language changes. I could give you funnier ones, but no, I'm not going to do that. Um, but language changes over time, so new versions of the Bible come out because the language changes. Real quick, just an example, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, okay? 
I, de- I challenge you, read it in the King James Version. Here's what you'll read. Charity is patient. Charity is kind. Charity is not rude or jealous or boastful. Now, when you and I read charity, we're like, I got to donate to, you know, Habitat for Humanity, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, that's charity for us. But in 1611, charity meant love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous, rude, or boastful. Or, you know. So what I'm trying to show you is there are multiple versions of the Bible, not because they got it wrong, but language changes. And there are different philosophies in how scholars bring the text to English. It's incredible. And I'm going to give you just one real quick example that is not original. I heard a preacher say this, and he said it this way. Somebody asked him the same question. Why are there so many versions of the Bible? If, if, God is, if his word's really infallible, they should have got it right the first time. Here was his response. He said, you know, um, automobiles, cars, I heard that they are very effective. They've radicalized, they've revolutionized the way we get, you know, to work and home. And it's amazing how they've really transformed the, the family. Uh, but I just don't know why we, if, if they work so well, and they're so revolutionary, why, don't we, why do we have so many? Why so many brands, so many colors, so many cup holders and, you know, makes and models? Like, why not just like one? I mean, if cars were really that effective and they got it right, then why not just one car? One, that's supposed to be a little funny. Are you tracking with me? There's more than one type of car because there's more than one type of person. And there's more than one type version of the Bible because there's more than one type person. There's different languages. There's different reading abilities. There's different cultures. There's different study purposes. There's all these reasons because there's different people. It's just because there's many options doesn't mean it's not legitimate and valuable. Is this making sense to anybody today? (laughs) One person clapped. (laughs) Y'all messing with me. By the way, I told you there were two versions I was going to warn you about. New World Translation and the Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon is the other one. That should be obvious. Uh, Book of Mormon is not the Bible or inspired. It is heresy. Real quick, super important litmus test for your version of the Bible. If you are looking at a version of the Bible and you want to verify, is this a good one? Here's how you do it. Flip to John chapter 1, verse 1. John 1, 1 is the litmus test for whether a scripture, a translation, is a good one or not. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. You know what the New World Translation says? In the beginning was a word. The word was with God and the word was a God. Ooh, see how they, just very subtle. And what they're doing, it's an attack and it's an assault on the deity of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. Scripture tells us that he is part of the Trinity, the Godhead in bodily form. He was divine and human. That is important because if he was not divine, then his blood that was shed for you on the cross was in vain. Do not be misled by false teaching and false religions.